welcome to this time of worship that we join in online again this morning for the St Andrews Uniting Church here in the beautiful Sunbury. I'm greeting you from getting closer to the church, uh, reminding us that while we're not yet at the point where we can reconvene inside, uh, we do have a little more freedom of movement, which we rejoice in. On this first Sunday after Pentecost, we're invited to contemplate the, the Trinitarian nature of God. Our reading from the Hebrew Scriptures is appropriately the first of the creation songs that begin our Bibles, where we see this relational nature of God present in the very earliest beginnings of our world. For some, the bringing of ecological themes into a religious and spiritual discussion is uncharted territory. Discussions of creation stories and the trinities so often focus only around the human elements of that story. And yet, this week's passages abound with ecological themes. They invite us to reclaim and to begin to live out the environmental themes that permeate the Bible and more fully live in harmony with other creatures, animate and inanimate. Theologian Elizabeth Johnson, in her book, interestingly titled, Ask the Beasts, Darwin and the God of Love, puts those ecological themes of the Bible and the Christian tradition into conversation with one another. Oh, sorry, into conversation with modern science and particularly in the context of today's environmental crisis. She writes this, theology in our ecological era needs to broaden its anthropocentric focus for its own adequacy. The mandate now is to bring the buzzing, blooming world of life back into theological focus. We need to ask the beasts, she says. Now that title, Ask the Beast, she is drawn from the book of Job, where Job invokes the wisdom of other creatures in how they relate to God. So in coming to worship this morning, we stand alongside our sibling creatures in offering our thanks and our praise to the God revealed to us in the awesome relational nature of Creator, Sustainer, and renewer, our creator, our friend, and the one whose breath and presence infects our mortal existence with eternal life. Living God, our caring creator, we are amazed by the beautiful world you have made that we call our home. Christ, our friend, who struggles with us and wraps us in redeeming love, we thank you for the compassion that you have modelled for all living creatures, human and non-human. Listening God, Holy Spirit of breath and presence, we are sustained by your active movement in our lives and your radiating presence throughout the world. Come, Come let, let us worship. worship. God, there has been no time when you have not been creating no space where you have not been imagining. Before our earliest ancestors existed, you were dreaming and designing what people could be. We were born into the flow of your creativity and breathe our every breath in your company. Come close to us. Come alive in us. Stir us like clouds caught by a summer breeze. May we cling to you like sweet peas to a fence and be as open to you as a blossoming sunflower to the sun. Give us an expansive vision of what our world is and can be. And let us move to the music of your resounding call. We surrender to you 
abundant and almighty God, and offer you our worship. Amen. blessings. You speak to us through earth. We hear you in the mountains, in the dance of life, suffering joy, death and new life, and in our innermost hearts. You were there when the stars burst forth. You have lived among us and you are with us now. Help us to hear and care for your beloved earth and its creatures, our neighbours. Amen. I recently read of a practice that I understand was common in the worship in colonial America that sounded interesting. What they call lining out, particularly with psalms and hymns. A worship leader read or sang a line which the congregation then repeated, endeavouring to replicate the leader's tone and voice inflections as not just their words. So this morning I invite you to have some fun with me, to experiment with me in lining out our psalm for today, Psalm 8 this grand psalm that celebrates God's creation. Remember, to not just repeat the words, but to replicate my tone and inflection. Psalm 8. O Lord, our Sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and infants you have founded a bulwark because of your foes to silence the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, What are human beings that you are mindful of them? Mortals that you care for them? Yet you have made them 
a little lower than God and crown them with glory and honour. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under their feet. All sheep and oxen and also the beasts of the field. The birds of the air and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O oh Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. All praise and honour be to you, O God, our Creator, our Friend and our Renewer, as we share this psalm of praise. Amen. Those of you who have had children or have grandchildren will likely know the Dr. Seuss story called The Lorax. It's a bit long for me to read you the whole story, but it goes sort of like this. We are taken on a journey into the street of the lifted Lorax, where in the grickle grass, where for those who look hard enough, you can still see where the Lorax once stood. The old character Wunstler still lives there. And if he has paid the right oddities, he will tell you the story of what happened to the Lorax that once grew there. This street had once been a most wonderful place. In the words of Dr. Seuss, Way back in the days when the grass was still green and the pond was still wet and the clouds were still clean and the song of the swomy swans rang out in space, one morning I came to this glorious place and I first saw the trees, the truffle trees, the bright coloured tufts of the truffle trees, mile after mile in the fresh morning breeze. And under the trees, I saw brown barber lutes frisking about in their barber lute suits as they played in the shade and ate truffle of fruits. From the rippleless pond came the comfortable sound of the humming fish humming while splashing around. But those trees, those trees, those truffle trees, all my life I'd been searching for trees such as these. The touch of their tufts was much softer than silk, and they had the sweet smell of fresh butterfly milk. He paints a most amazing idyllic picture. But once the, the once saw in these trees more than beauty, the end was nigh. He cut down first a single tree from which he made a lovely product called Thneed. But a character popped out of the stump and announced himself as the Lorax. I speak for the trees, for the trees have no tongues. But the Wunstler wasn't listening. He saw profit and he began to cut down the truffle trees and made ever more the need that became much sought after. So other members of his family joined him and they cut down ever more trees 
and they built a factory to process their need. Regularly, the Lorax would knock on the, his factory door announcing, I am Lorax, who speaks for the trees, which you seem to be chopping as fast as you please. And he pointed out that the Barbaloots had left because they no longer had food. And later, the Swomi swans took flight. And finally, the hummingfish were forced to flee their pond because it was so polluted with sludge from their factory. And while the Wunstler was sad to see them all go, he just carried on his business as usual and kept cutting down the truffle trees. That was until all the truffle trees were gone. No more. No more trees, no more need, no more work to be done. So in no time, my uncles and aunts, everyone, all waved me goodbye. They jumped in my cars and drove away under the smoke-smuggered stars. Now all that was left neath the bad-smelling sky was my big empty factory, the Lorax and I. And finally, the Lorax too left, and the old Wunstler was left all alone. And the story ends with the Wunstler giving you a truffle seed, the very last one, and putting you in charge of that seed, exhorting you to plant it and treat it with care, in the hope that one day all his friends might come back and his final words are, unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. The Lorax is someone, we're told, who speaks for the trees because the trees have no tongues. Think about that sentence. I speak for the trees, for the trees have no tongues. Who speaks for the trees in our world? And for all the other creatures of God's creation in our world today? Do we? Are our lives committed to planting and tending the seeds of new life in the world of nature? In the story, there is hope held out that the person who received that seed will take positive actions so that the trees can have a full life. Friends, God invites us to care for earth, to partner with God in the ongoing work of creation. If you were to speak up to care for creation, what would you say? And who would you say it to? Is it possible that the trees and other parts of creation might also be speaking to you? What might they be saying to you? If the trees are speaking, how might you talk with them? Let us pray. Creator of love and action, as much as we love you, sometimes we close our ears to your voice. We long to continue to listen to you, even when it is to know that earth is in pain. Help us to be servants to creation sheltering it from harm. We humbly pray to be healers and caretakers of earth, of both suffering and beauty. Amen. The Creator guards our lives. Christ knows our struggles. 
the Spirit guides our steps. All speak to us from the mountains and the rivers, the cities and towns, the deserts and forests. Praise be to God. A reading from the opening chapter of our Bible, from the book of Genesis, and reading from the International Children's Bible. In the beginning, God created the sky and the earth. The earth was empty and had no form. Darkness covered the ocean, and God's Spirit was moving over the water. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, so he divided the light from the darkness. God named the light day and the darkness night. Evening passed and morning came. This was the first day. Then God said, Let there be something to divide the water in two. So God made the air to divide the water in two. Some of the water was above the air and some of the water below it. God named the air sky. Evening passed and morning came. This was the second day. Then God said, Let the water under the sky be gathered together so the dry land will appear. And it happened. God named the dry land earth. He named the water that was gathered together seas. God saw that this was good. Then God said, Let the earth produce plants. Some plants will make grain for seeds. Others will make fruit with seeds in it. Every seed will produce more of its own kind of plant. And it happened. The earth produced plants. Some plants had grain for seeds. The trees made fruit with seeds in it. Each seed grew its own kind of plant. God saw that all this was good. Evening passed and morning came. This was the third day. Then God said, Let there be lights in the sky to separate day from night. These lights will be used for signs, seasons, days and years. They will be in the sky to give light to the earth. And it happened. So God made the two large lights. He made the brighter light to rule the day. He made the smaller light to rule the night. He also made the stars. God put all these in the sky to shine on the earth. They are ready to rule over the day and over the night. He put them there to separate the light from the darkness. God saw that all these things were good. Evening passed and morning came. This was the fourth day. Then God said, Let the water be filled with living things and let birds fly in the air above the earth. So God created the large sea animals. He created every living thing that moves in the sea. The sea is filled with these living things. Each one produces more of its own kind. God also made every bird that flies, and each bird produces more of its own kind. God saw that this was good. God blessed them and said, have many younger ones and grow in number. Fill the water of the seas and let the birds grow in number on the earth. Evening passed and morning came. This was the fifth day. Then God said, Let the earth be filled with animals and let each produce more of its own kind. Let there be tame animals and small crawling animals and wild animals and let each produce more of its kind. And it happened. So God made the wild animals, the tame animals, and all the small crawling animals to produce more of their own kind. God saw that this was good. Then God said, Let us make human beings in our image and likeness, and let them rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky. Let them rule over the tame animals, over all the earth, and over all the small crawling animals on the earth. So God created human beings in his image. In the image of God, he created them. He created them male and female. 
God blessed them and said, Have many children and grow in number. Fill the, fill the earth and be its master. Rule over the fish in the sea and over the birds in the sky. Rule over every living thing that moves on the earth. God said, Look, I have given you all the plants that have grain for seeds, and I have given you all the trees whose fruits have seeds in them. They will be food for you. I have given all the green plants to all the animals to eat. They will be food for every wild animal, every bird of the air, and every small crawling animal. And it happened. God looked at everything he had made, and it was very good. Evening passed, and morning came. This was the sixth day. So the sky, the earth, and all that filled them were finished. By the seventh day, God finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. God blessed the seventh day and made it a holy day. He made it holy because on that day, he rested. He rested from all the work he had done in creating the world. This is the story of the creation of the sky and the earth, when the Lord God made the earth and the sky. In this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, it's Trinity Sunday, and that gets us thinking around the, the relation that is God, the, the interrelatedness of this being, this entity, the three in one and the one yet three. And so it's appropriate that our thoughts are taken to this opening chapter of our Bibles, the first creation song that speaks to us not only around the, the different dimensions of God, but of the interrelatedness of the world that God created. I wonder if you've ever paused and thought to what extent the sense, this strong sense of rhythm that runs through this story, what it might say to us about the nature of God, but also about how we live. That rhythm I'm talking around is this pattern that keeps repeating throughout the story. God speaks, God does. God notices, and finally God pauses. Each cycle of this rhythm begins with God announcing his idea. Let there be light. And good ideas always are always the beginning of every invention. Every good idea good thing that we enjoy someone had an idea good idea at its outset and turned it into a reality but more than that being the language of good ideas this is the language of an enabler god allows things to happen without coercion let there be light he says let that's permission so we get a picture of God from the outset of being an ultimate ideas person, but also of the supreme permission giver. Which takes us into the second part of the rhythm. God then goes into action. God's not content to have had a good idea. Now, don't we all know people who are good ideas people? I maybe have a plethora of good ideas, maybe the best ideas ever. But don't count on them to, to make any of it come into reality. They just can't do anything. They're just ideas people. Now, I had a bit of an ideas person as a colleague in my previous placement. He had great ideas. So many of them sometimes. We sometimes joke he had 10 a day. Um, but he needed help to actually choose which idea he would focus on today, this week, this month, and how to actually plan out the next steps to start to turn the idea into a reality. 
it was great to have in a team because there's always good ideas coming, but we needed to work together to shape the ideas into a reality. We see in this story how God turns his ideas into reality. And with each idea accomplished, God names this newly created thing. We probably already um, are aware of how in the Bible, when a person is given a name, it's quite deliberate and it's quite carefully chosen because that name is understood to be indicating something important about the identity and the character of the person. The name captures the essence of the person. So choosing these names of day and night, sky, earth and seas uh, are not just plucked out of some grab, grab bag somewhere of sort of a multitude of names, uh, this one will do for this, um, they're deliberately chosen. And it obviously tells us something important about God and about these foundations of our world. We'll come back to that in a moment. The next stage in this cycle sees God looking at what has been created. So he sits back and takes it in, enjoys what has been created, what now exists, and notices that it is good and declares it to be good. There is no separation between good light and bad dark, for instance. Even the blackness of night is declared good by its creator. It's a creation of God, equally alongside the light of the day. And that might get us thinking around what's been going on coming to light in the US at the moment with the riots that are going on following the death of this black man by a white policeman and how that is bringing to the surface some of the injustice in our own country towards our own uh, indigenous peoples, the black people of our land, the black fellas, and in so many other countries. But there's not even a hierarchy of goodness between one bit of creation and another. There's not one part that's declared you're more good than this part. They're all equally good. But I'm taken by the sense in which God paused, in which God took note of what was created, how God pondered the worth of every part of his creation and declared it good. Now, I know I too often rush past much of creation without taking as much notice of it as perhaps I should. Sue and I can be out taking a walk and I'll be enjoying striding along, enjoying some fresh air in the lungs, getting outside, just letting the body relax a little bit as we stride along and Sue will pull me up because she's noticed something that is beautiful and often so interesting. Something that I've walked past and haven't taken notice of. Now perhaps that's one of the good things that has emerged for us out of this time of restricted movement. We've been forced to slow down. And perhaps we are learning to take notice of what is right under our noses in our neighbourhoods. Stuff that's been there all the time, but we just haven't paused and taken it in. 
And perhaps we're learning to recognise the goodness of our physical environment. This environment that's found opportunity to breathe again as we've paused in our lives. That's important because I think something happens inside us when we stop and notice and acknowledge the inherent goodness of the multiple facets of this created order, our physical environment. Which takes us to the final part of this rhythm, where we learn that God paused and rested as evening has closed in, the hours of night have passed before the sun comes up again tomorrow when there's a new idea and new action to be pursued. There is this time of rest. And we recognise the interrelatedness of the parts of this creation because each part of the story evolved out of what has gone before. So on this Trinity Sunday, when the relationship that is God is in our minds, we're reminded of how interrelated are all of the various parts, the multitude of parts of this world that God created, made in God's image. And perhaps we might be encouraged to make this same rhythm of speaking and doing and savouring and stopping a reality in our own lives, in our daily lives, in our weekly living and in the, our time of worshipping together. But of course, there's still something, isn't there? The pattern is not exactly complete until we focus on the hallowed seventh day. This day is called holy because on it God rested. And that might prompt us to ponder the important place of rest in our lives. Perhaps this enforced rest has brought the need for that back into focus for us. Perhaps we might even be feeling there's been too much rest in this time. We might reflect on that time and wonder what has been holy about the way that we have rested during this time. And maybe we might wonder and ponder how we might put holiness and restfulness together in our reality. Would you pray with me? God, help us, we pray, to establish such a holy rhythm in our lives, our daily lives, our weekly lives, our worship life as we learn to speak, as we learn to do, as we learn to take notice, and as we learn to pause and to rest. Help us, we pray, to rest in ways that are holy, that honour you, and in ways that recreate our being, that we might continue to live this rhythm in service and honour for you. Amen.
This morning, our prayer of thanksgiving and intercession is centred around the themes of climate change and racial harmony. These two themes that are very much in our thoughts at the moment. The final prayer is one written by Martin, Martin Luther King Jr. Let us pray. Thank you, God, for your immeasurably big heart. You don't need the credit for what you do. You don't need the recognition. You don't need the thanks. Where would we be without your refusal to despair, your resolve to never give up, your willingness to keep working to sustain the cosmos which you love? The ingenuity of your mind is unfathomable. How perfectly you set up all the ecosystems of Earth, the balances of climate and vegetation and independent species. How deep your trust in us to implant in us the wisdom to care for the land and the sea, to be your co-workers in ensuring the flourishing of all. We pray for people living with the effects of climate change, for the sake of those facing rising temperatures, drought and water shortages. Creator God, in your mercy, renew this damaged world. For the sake of those facing unpredictable weather, disrupted seasons and failed crops. For the sake of those facing flooding, land loss and salination of vital water supplies. Creator God, in your mercy, renew this damaged world. For the sake of all those who fear the changing climates, for the sake of the poor, the vulnerable and the refugee, Creator God, in your mercy, renew this damaged world. For the sake of us all, Creator God, in your mercy, recreate our hearts that we might partner with you to renew this damaged world. A prayer for racial harmony. God and Father of all, in your love you made all the nations of the world to be a family and your Son taught us to love one another. Yet our world is riven apart with prejudice, arrogance and pride. Please help the different races to love and understand one another better. Increase among us sympathy, tolerance and goodwill that we may learn to appreciate the gifts the other races bring to us and to see in all people our brothers and sisters for whom Christ died. Save us from jealousy, hatred and fear and help us to live together as members of one family at home in the world sons and daughters of one father who live in the liberty of the children of God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Yes, Jesus, I want to be on your right side or your left side, not for any selfish reason. I want to be on your right side or your best side, not in terms of some political kingdom or ambition, but I just want to be there in love and in justice and in truth and in commitment to others so we can make of this old world a new world. Amen. Just before we finish this morning's worship, uh, there's two matters that we think is we need to bring to your attention. Firstly, we're aware you'll be wondering just when we might be able to regather for worship. Uh, the Church Council is giving serious thought to this and uh, keeping a careful watch on the uh, what the instructions from the government are in terms of allowing gatherings. 
Meanwhile, we are developing our protocols as to what we will need to have put in place in terms of sanitation practices and different um, practices in terms of how we occupy the building and function within that building. Um, and we are very carefully stepping those uh, requirements out so that they're in place and we can begin to resume uh, gathered worship and other activities at the earliest time. So but in, we're not sure when that will be. Um, there's talk around the 22nd of November the government might allow up to 50 people. Um, obviously that's not as many as we would normally have on a Sunday but there will be some we realise um, will not feel free to rejoin until there's a vaccine or some more assurance um, around the safety to do so. So we may well be surveying the, all of you shortly uh, around what your thoughts might be around that. So in the meantime, keep your eyes open and uh, we'll keep you informed uh, as to how that's likely to unfold. The second thing is you'll be aware that there is a Royal Commission has been called into um, violence and abuse towards people with disabilities. We've been asked if we might distribute a letter uh, that invites you if you wish and feel as though you may be in that category to make a submission to the Royal Commission um, either in a written submission or requesting a face-to-face -face interview with a member of the Commission. Uh, that letter has been circulated through our email list uh, and it will be on our Facebook page as well. So look for it in either of those two places, please. Uh, and that's your invitation from the Royal Commission via the church uh, to make contact with them. In the closing verses of Paul's second letter to the church in Corinth, we read, Finally, brothers and sisters, farewell. Put things in order. Listen to my appeal. Agree with one another. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, he concludes. Perhaps more than in the other readings, the couple of verses that close off Paul's letter to the, or second letter that we have at least, to the church in Corinth, it lands us squarely in the depiction of God as Trinity. In the well-known and well-used words that we have come to know as the grace. Today is the best of opportunities to stop and sink down into the awareness of God as a relational being. God as relationship within God's own nature. Richard Draw and Mick Morell in their collaborative work called The Divine Dance, The Trinity and Your Transformation make the intriguing comment that if we take the Trinity seriously, we have to say, in the beginning was the relationship. In the beginning was the relationship. Where do our thoughts go from there? If we are made in God's image, how does that essential relationality show up in our nature? How does the example of God as three in one affect our way of living and worshipping and serving? Those verses suggest that in closing our worship together this morning that we finish by turning Paul's exhortation into a statement of commitment that we make in response. That might go like this. 
as we go from here, this we will do. We will put things in order. Listen to the appeal of truth. Agree with one another and live in peace. Faithful to the God of love and peace. To which we hear God's wonderful words of blessing upon us. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all today and every day. Amen.